first growing up, I wanted to be a pop star. Like, um, I think I was about eight or something, and I saw Donny Osmond, and he had a leather jacket with his name in studs on the back, and he had a piano with light bulbs that lit up when he played. And I just thought, hmm, that looks like a good job. But then, kind of as I was growing up, punk hit, and it was kind of anti-stardom. So after that, I kind of narrowed it down to, I wanted to be a musician, a successful musician, rather than a pop star. I was always in bands at, at school, at uh, Sixth Form College, and I was actually in a band with Paul Heaton, um, which is a kind of prototype of the house minds, called the Stomping Pond Frogs. When I finished Sixth Form, I moved down to Brighton and the drummer moved up to London, and Paul just got it, because he thought we were going to go sort of semi-professional at that point. We were getting gigs up in London and things, and we kind of thought something was happening, but we had sort of committed to doing degrees, and, and Paul just got really pissed off and moved up to Hull and stomped, stamped his little foot. But we kept in touch, and I put I put the House Martins on at various clubs where I was DJing, um, quite unsuccessfully. Um, and then I played on a couple of demos because originally they were just it was just Paul and Stan. So when they did demos, they needed a rhythm section. So me and the drummer from the old band played on the first two dem demos. And then Paul had had a, a to-do with the bass player um, just before their first kind of proper tour. And so he just said, you know, will you fill in? Because I knew all the songs. So I was only really supposed to be filling in. Um, but like, you know, we, all of a sudden we had a record contract and all of a sudden we're on the radio and there's free women and drinks every night. And it was very difficult to kind of, uh, to ever get off once you get on the bus. Like you always remember your first sex. It's not necessarily the best, but it's always the most moving. Um, so having dreamt of being a musician, to, to be on the radio, I mean, I remember the moment when we first ever heard our record on the radio, doing Top of the Pops and things like that, playing Glastonbury. They're always kind of like life-defining moments. And we were quite a close-knit, intense kind of foursome. And to go through all that together, especially as I'd known Paul for years and it had been our dream, you know, there's so many moments we'd be on stage where we'd just look at each other and go, oh my God, we've done it, we're here. So it was, yeah, it was great, but musically it wasn't really what I wanted to do. It didn't, it didn't really, um, I didn't really flex any of my musical muscles. Because Paul and Stan wrote all the songs, I didn't produce anything, I just, you know, turned up and played the bass. The chances of you ever becoming a, you know, successful musician are one in a million anyway. And I figured to do it twice, just is, you know, isn't going to happen. So yeah, I mean, I kind of went back to Brighton and thought, right, what should I do? Sort of contemplated going back to the record shop. <laughs> but luckily, um, about a week later, a friend of mine who worked for Record Company had this Eric B and Rakeem track, and they said, what would you, what would you do that, you know, I don't really, they didn't really understand dance music that much. And they said, what would you do? And I said, well, you could remix it, you could do this. And I did a demo and they said, oh yeah, go in the studio next week. And kind of fell right on my feet. Um, and that, that remix was quite a big hit. So just, uh, there was one door closed, another career door opened, literally a week later. In those days, white people didn't make black music. It wasn't called dance music then, it was called black music. And, but I remember I was doing remixes and then watching people, watching black kids dance in a club to it, thinking, well, they haven't stopped dancing and gone, hmm, sounds like a whitey to me, do you know what I mean? Uh, so I kind of thought I could, but it was always remixing other people, but then, my record company, who I was still signed to because of the House Martins, they started saying, look, how come you're only making records for other people and not for us? And kind of bullied me a bit into doing it myself. Um, and originally it was Norman Cook featuring, um, which is quite a big mouthful. It's Norman Cook featuring Billy Bragg, Norman Cook featuring Walski. Norman Cook's not a very cool name for dance music anyway, is it? I definitely kind of had ego problems after that after uh, you know being successful twice and this time it was me producing it and writing a lot of the stuff i did actually begin to believe that i was talented rather than lucky um which is a very negative thing i kind of lost it turned into a bit of an arse frankly um turned into a workaholic pissed a lot of people off um including a lot of my nearest and dearest and then my wife left me and a few of my friends pointed out what a wanker I was, and I kind of uh, went into a spiral of self-doubt. I just had a bit of a breakdown, I suppose. I kind of fell to bits, and the music fell to bits as well. So at that point, I, didn't, uh, I was actually considering becoming a fireman. Because <laughs> I figured it's like the same as being a musician. You hang around for ages playing pool with your mates. 
then you go and do something very exciting and glamorous. And, and you get the girls, because it's, you know, the rubber trousers definitely do it for the chicks. In 88, when everyone was doing Acid House, I was kind of doing very down-tempo, kind of reggae-based stuff. And then I was at, I was at this uh, boys' own uh, weekend thing at Bugner, uh, Bugner Butlins. Bugner Butlins. And just suddenly got it. And weirdly enough, I found out years later that it was Darren Emerson who was DJing. And I was in the middle of the dance floor. I think I was walking across the dance floor to go to the toilet because I wouldn't have been dancing. Got a bit lost halfway across because strange things were going on in my head. And all of a sudden, everyone was on the dance floor and it was, he was playing I'll Be Your Friend, Robert Owens, and it's just going, I'll be your, I'll be your. And everybody just suddenly got, you know, everyone started smiling at each other and then it eventually goes, I'll be your friend. And we all just kind of hugged each other and I'm like, right, I get it now. So, yeah, that was about three years too late. But um, I finally got the house thing and then I started making records as the Mighty Dub Cats and Pizza Man. Um, started working with Loaded, who are kind of the, the uh, skin prototype, the house label. And that was just friends of mine and, and they, they helped me out as well. They kind of said, look, forget pop records because you kind of... Like Beats International started making club records and then I ended up making pop records. And they said, go back to club records and remember have your DJ's head on when you're making them. And I just started making better records and putting them out on Loaded. Um, put some out on our own label, Southern Fried, because no one released them. And gradually kind of got my, got my groove back. And I'd bumped into the Chemical Brothers, uh, the social, funnily enough. And it was like this new thing, and we didn't have a name for it yet. <clears throat> it was this new thing of like people who liked, who'd grown up listening to hip hop then gone to house, but then got a bit bored of house, so kind of mixed, wanted to mix the two, um, put the fun back in clubbing and whatever. And so they kind of, Tom and Ed got me DJing again, but there weren't really enough records of the genre to fill a whole evening. So most of the first album was basically me just making records that I wanted to play out when I was DJing, that no one else at the time was making. So as a result, it's like a, the first album's sort of a collection of 12-inch singles rather than a cohesive album. And also, like, the first track was recorded two years before the second one because it was kind of, you know... I never sat down and thought, I'm doing an album. So in those days, dance artists didn't really do albums. Skint had never released an album before. So th that was, yeah, it was... It was uh, the first album was pretty sort of greatest hits of the last three years. The first album was kind of like experimenting with things and by the second album I kind of had the blueprint of and it was it was kind of using introducing new sounds that you don't normally hear in dance music like you know rock guitars surf guitars um, yeah and it, it once I'd kind of, we sort of established that the second album was like a more refined version of the first and also sounded more like an album rather than a compilation. And I know, I'd tell you, sort of, I'd worked out what the big beat formula was. The energy of house music, the rhythm normally of hip hop music, but with a kind of pop sensibility in there and a sense of irreverence and fun. Um, not a bad formula, but only funny once. Because on my passport it says musician. But I think when I get a new passport, I'd probably change it to record producer because I'm not really a musician. What I do is I just, um, I'm audio collage. I kind of make records out of discarded bits of other people's records. I'm a record collector and I've found this record called Take Your Praise by Camille Yarbrough. And she uh, obligingly sung the first three lines a cappella. Um, which is, it's a dance producer, your ears prick up, it's like, ah, oh, I can play And I just say, you know, it's a beautiful sentiment, beautifully sung, so I just kind of reconstructed another track around it. And if you hear, I think the, the original is just getting re-released on this, someone's done a compilation album, which I think is a great idea, a compilation album of the originals of, of over, overly sampled songs. And it kind of goes, my version was quite different, it's in a different key from the original and a different kind of feel to it. But, um, bless her, Camille, uh, you know, it's just that one decision, I'm like, I know, I'll, I'll sing the first three lines, then the band comes in and for the fourth one. <laughs> nice one, Camille, thanks. Intense state of bemusement. Try not to take it too seriously. And especially after the ego problems I had before, 
I definitely didn't want to get carried away. So trying to keep my feet on the ground, but my feet just getting swept under me on a daily basis by these freaky, freaky things happening. I remember the manager saying, oh, you know, we're going to do this, dude. we could get this album gold. And, uh, you know, I've got these plans and I'm going to put you, you know, you're going to sell out, you know, the forum or something like that. And after about six months, he came, he said, you know my plan, he said, is it all going out of control? He said, I'm not in control anymore. He said, I'm not planning these things, they're just happening. So we knew it was, we knew it was getting somewhere, but we never thought it would be like, you know, up there with Robbie Williams and the Spice Girls, you know. That was never the intention, and, you know, if anyone, if we said, oh yeah, you know, we're going to have a number one album, they would have come, yeah, dreamers, dream on. Because there, there was a phase where it was kind of all happening at once, and I was like, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that, yeah, yeah. oh, what, that, yes, I'll do that. And I kind of realised I'm a bit old to, to keep that kind of punishing schedule, both physically and also, you know, my heart isn't in it to actually beat myself up. I'd already lost a wife and, and, and a long-term girlfriend through just the pressures of it. And kind of this time around, I didn't want it to encroach on my personal life quite so much. But then again, my personal life suddenly became part of it especially after I met Zoe. So yeah, no, it's been a strange old roller coaster. Mainly ups, a few hairy corners, and if, you know, a few points where we're just going, woo, and a few points where we're like, woo, hold on, can we just slow down a bit? Years, I've, I've tried to maintain some kind of anonymity, and I think a lot of people who do dance music do it because they want to make music, but they don't want to be centre stage. And I got quite good at sort of, you know, just staying in the background. And tons of people knew my name but didn't really know what I looked like. And I was doing so well. And then, of course, once I met Zoe, that just blew it completely. So, yeah, but then I just had to say, well, there's no way we can do this. Um, I mean, Zoe did kind of warn me. She said, you know, if us do go out together, it's going to, you know, you're going to get tabloid, you know. Because I remember Hello or OK magazine when we first got engaged, I said, who is this mystery person that's always gone out with? And it's like, I'd managed to avoid their kind of interest for all those years. But it was all right, I mean, after, the good thing is, because I've been doing this for so long, I kind of flirted with a bit of fame with the house mines and things like that. So I was kind of prepared. I think if, if you come a long way, baby, and be my first album, I think I'd be, you know, on crack by now. The cutoff point was Woodstock. And there was, a, there was so many kind of big things like Glastonbury and that, that we wanted to do. So I said, look, I'll do Glastonbury. And we did a big show with the Chemical Brothers at Red Rocks in Denver. And then Woodstock was the last thing. I said, after that, um, I'm going to get married. I'm going to go on honeymoon. I'm going to take a few months off. No more promotion. But of course, the awards ceremonies, you kind of had to go to. So I think that was what frustrated me because I, I, in my head, I'd finished that album. And just over that autumn, I kept kind of having to come out of retirement. I was trying to sort of chill out and, you know, I went home and just did the washing up for a couple of weeks and, you know, caught up on my washing and um, slept for about two weeks. And then they kept kind of calling me up and going, oh, go over, you know, go to LA for the Grammys or something. And I was like, oh, right. And I shouldn't have gone really, but you kind of, you have to really. <laughs> I also felt a bit cheap, like I was prostituting myself just so I got some more silverware. There's no way you go in the studio and try to follow up a triple platinum album without thinking, oh my God, I've got to follow that up. Um, yeah, I had all these little mantras that I used to say to myself to stop myself getting freaked out, like, like don't worry, because even if the album's absolute dog shit, it'll still sell 100,000, because that many people buy it the day it's released. So even if it's rubbish, it'll still pay the mortgage. And I repeat that to myself over and over again, and then don't worry, because if it, if it does less well than the last album, you get more of your life back and you get more free time, you won't be in the papers so much. And all these things I had to keep, you know, to stop myself getting freaked out. Because otherwise, you kind of do what Radiohead do and you just agonise for four years, you know, about whether or not it's good enough. And I think halfway through we kind of decided that rather than spend two years making this next album, I'd spend six months and just, for better or worse, get it out there. Because that's the way I've always worked. I've never put, I've never kind of agonised about things. It's just like, suck it and see you know, see if people like it. And a lot of the time, stuff I do off the cuff seems more successful than the stuff that I really think about. So, um, yeah, we just thought, get it out. And then with Zoe being pregnant, I kind of wanted, I definitely wanted to get it out before the baby. So that, that was kind of incentive to get it finished and not gaze at my navel quite so much. About halfway through the album, I was worried that it might sound a bit soft. You know, I might have gone a bit soft, because I'm sitting there looking out at the sea, 
dolphins swimming past, whales gambling, you know, making, oh my God, am I doing a really kind of, you know, soft record. So some of the tracks like Drop the Hate, I kind of in, put, wanted to put a bit of tension back into it. Because I mean, the sentiment, Drop the Hate, Forgive Each Other, is kind of like loved up and peaceful, but I don't know, that I, the, the rhythm track had to be quite aggressive to kind of counteract that. Either that or it would be kind of like, hello clouds, hello sky, everything's lovely. So I'd want to keep a bit of tension in there and a bit of um, grit. Bootleg with of, of a, a cappella Jim Morrison stuff, and most of it was kind of tripped out poetry. But he just sings these three lines, and as soon as I heard it, I just thought, oh yeah, that sounds like a track. Again, you know, your ears pick up. Three lines of a cappella Jim Morrison singing, I can make a track out of that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, it's not that I am a huge Doors, you know, fan. I mean, I've got the, you know, the, the three big albums, but I have investigated that far back. The reason I bought the record was because it was a cappella, not necessarily because it was Jim Morrison. Could have equally been Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin or something. But I think it, it's not quite nice because he was sort of in the same vein of uh, social awareness, shall we say as uh, I've been in the, for the last 10 years. So I definitely feel he'd, he'd be a kindred spirit. <laughs> he'd probably prove, I hope. <laughs>